talking about, uh, we were, uh, so let's, let's, let's remind ourselves, we understood circle compactifications, we, we understood. We're going to start orbifolds. Excellent. We we're going to start studying orbifolds. Excellent. So, uh, uh, so let's do that. So first, let's take the simplest case of an orbifold, which is R mod Z. Okay. So suppose we've got a, a non-compact x coordinate. Okay. We've got a non-compact x coordinate, and so we have x is identified with minus x. Okay. This space is like half space because whatever's happening here is the same as what's happening here. And so it's not really an independent. The space is, is like the half line rather than the full line. Now, if we were just doing field theory on such a space, okay, we would uh, write down wave functions, let's say, you know, mode, uh, mode functions of our fields that would obey some boundary condition here. Um, and uh, uh, Effectively, it would be it's like some reflection. And we could try that there may be some new divergences depending on what happens here. Maybe not. Uh, in string theory, though, there is a new phenomenon, okay, um, which is you know, going to be the focus of, of this part of the lectures, which is that apart from these modes that you're co you come in, go, they will effectively reflect. Apart from that happening, uh, what will also happen is that there will be new states that are localized near a x equals 0. Okay. So this is what we want to, want to study uh, and what we want to understand. Okay. So let's, 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 let, let's look at it as follows. Suppose we've got this x of sigma. Okay. Uh, we have this x of sigma field. Now, x of sigma has two kinds of states. Be, this, this, this string here is periodic. Okay? Yeah. Um, because it's periodic, the boundary condition, I mean, periodic meaning x is the same as minus x. Okay? Because it's, sorry, the, the, the thing is periodic means. Uh, and we are looking at closed strings. Exactly. Yeah. That what's happening at 0 is, 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 is uh, what happens at 2 pi. So, what we normally do is to say x of sigma plus 2 pi is equal to x of sigma. But now, just because x and minus x are the same thing, there is a second possibility. Okay? So this is possibility 1. There's a second possibility, and the second possibility is x of sigma plus 2 pi is equal to minus x of sigma. Because x and minus x are the same thing. Okay. Now, um, uh, this sector is what we're going to call the untwisted sector. This sector is untwisted because uh, on the space circle. So suppose we think of. Uh, um, Sp the world sheet having sigma and tau on the space circle, it's a normal kind of state. When you go around the space direction, the string comes back to itself. Okay? In terms of a partition function, you know, in terms of a partition function on the torus, when we compute the torus partition function of the of the orbifold theory, um, what we will do is of course project onto states that obey the orbifold condition. Okay? So suppose we uh, put a twist such that uh, um, a twist that takes x to minus x. Uh, we will pr put a, an operator 1 plus t divided by 2 where this t is like this. But we can do this either in the sector where uh, uh, either in the untwisted sector or in the in the uh, in the twisted sector. Now, in the twisted sector, what have we done? We put one factor of this t on the space direction, right? Because what is this t? It just tells you that the string t tells you that the string here and the string here are not equal 
but are equal only up to x goes to minus x. That's clear, right? Here, t is telling you that the string here and the string here are not equal, but equal only up to x goes to minus x. So this, uh, in Euclidean space, the same t operation on space that in that is important to enforcing the projection in time has to be there also in space because otherwise your partition function wouldn't be modular invariant. Okay, and that has a simple interpretation as producing the the twisted sectors. Okay, so the same operation in space there is an operation in time that in, in that enforces projection onto invariance under z2 symmetry. Only states that uh, are because x is minus x, some state that has a wave function for x that is different from the wave function for minus x is not allowed. So the wave function wouldn't be single valued. That projector, this 1 plus t by 2 factor like this, breaks up into 1. So, so the kind of partition function you will have is like 1, 1 plus t1. So t is this x goes to minus x flip. Right? Plus, that's so far in the untwisted sector of the projection, but you also have in the twisted sector of the projection. So t1 plus t2. Okay? This will be the full partition function of our theory. We'll compute, we'll compute all of it in a little bit, but just to get orientation. Is this clear? Okay. By the way, the question of whether this is really modular invariant or not um, is sort of interesting because so far we've only ensured invariance under this cycle to this cycle flip. But what about this cycle? Suppose we choose this cycle to be, th this cycle and this cycle to be the two fundamental cycles of our theory. There's no God-given basis of cycles. So we should be able to, so suppose we choose this, let's see what that translates to for this. Here of course it will be 1, 1, because under doing this and this, there's no t operation. Here, in this case it will be, um, this will still be 1, but this will be t, because to get to this cycle, you do this and this, and there's one factor of t. Okay, what about here? Um, here, exactly. So here you will get t and t, because this is t, and this is 1 and t. Whereas here you will get t and 1, because t squared is 1. So in any choice of basis, you get the same set of diagrams, though which diagram goes to what is reshuffled. But the sum is nice and modular invariant. Okay, uh, fine. So let's, now, 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 now let's, now let's, uh, uh, let's keep going. Let's do some, uh, let's do a little work. Okay. Um, the first thing we want to do is to find the spectrum of uh, oscillators, the spectrum of states in the twisted sector. Okay, so how do we deal with this guy? Well, this guy, how do we ensure that x is minus x as, the, as, as sigma goes over 2 pi? That's sort of easy. If instead of the modes being uh, what we previously did, what we previously did was to make e to the power 2 pi n sigma. We expanded everything in terms of 2 pi n sigma. Okay? Yeah. Now, n plus half sigma will do the job. Right? Because when we take sigma to sigma plus 2 pi, the 2 pi will do nothing with the n but will produce a factor of pi e to the power i pi with the half, and therefore that's a, that's, a fact, uh, that's a factor of minus one. Okay, so do you see that effectively 
what we have here is that our oscillators are all half integrally modded. Okay? Now, so we will have an oscillator at, at moding half, an oscillator at moding three halves, an oscillator at moding uh, five halves, and so on. We'll have the same kind of oscillator expansion as before, just that the moding is shifted from being integer moded to half integer moded. Note that there is no zero mode. Zero mode doesn't uh, doesn't obey this uh, um, doesn't obey this cons this constraint. Okay. Now the lack of the zero mode. Can somebody give me a physical interpretation? It's true. Symmetry would uh, ensure zero mode that symmetry is broken, but uh, a little more specifically. I mean, if I put a little bump of put bump potential, that would also la lack the symmetry, but that would be more or less a zero mode. But still, by a boundary condition, that F is still zero. <laughs> All correct. It would be nice to be a little more physical. Let me. You see. Imagine that this is the x equals 0 word. What is a boundary condition? A boundary condition is that if you start at x, you end at minus x. OK, that ensures that our string is located in center of mass at 0. How can a string, you see, if you've got a closed string, it can move anywhere. But you've got a, got a string that's forced to go from x to minus x, the center of mass has to be 0. Okay? So it's obvious from this picture that there's no zero mode. All these modes live around x equals 0. Okay? And then they have oscillator modes, half, three halves, five halves, and so on. Okay. So now there are two things that we are supposed to do uh, to complete uh, uh, wh what we'd like to know is in the twisted sector, uh, what effective masses of states do we get? What do I mean by that? I mean, you know, we've got these oscillators here, but in we've chosen one direction in which we've got this orbifold direction. But the other axes are just normal. So in the other axes, you've got normal physics. You've got modes moving around, you know. Uh, there's momentum that labels the eigenstates of the modes. Momentum will away some Marshall, Marshall, some Marshall condition. Each of the oscillators here will influence the Marshall condition of the the, uh, the lower dimensions. So I want to know if I've just got. Uh, uh, I eventually, we'll be putting this thing on a circle. So you can imagine this as a compact over here. The orbifold direction is compactified. I've got uh, non-compact directions downstairs. I want to know what effective mass squares we get from the uh, motion of the. Uh, from the from the uh, oscillator numbers in the twisted sector. Okay. In order to do that, we need to know the zero point energy of the twisted sector. Okay. Now this zero point energy um, uh, um, this zero point energy we need to calculate and see. Let's let's calculate. Okay, so let us first remember the calculation for the untwisted sector, and then we'll see how it's modified. Okay, Rem so we've done this many times, but let's let's do it quickly again. Okay, remember what we did was to add one plus two plus three plus four. Uh, we added one plus two plus three plus four, um, and then half of that, if we wanted energies. Okay, so half of. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. We found this was minus 1 by 12, but I'll just remem remind you how we found it was minus 1 by 12. Well, so exactly, so that we can uh, quickly, quickly modify it. 
First, we put this theory on a, on a circle of length L. So this became 1 by L plus 2 by L plus 3 by L plus 4 by L, L and so on. Then what we did was to take this and cut it off at some given physical momentum. Okay, So if that physical momentum cut off was lambda, so what we did was make this half of sum over n by L times f of n by L lambda. Right? It was, there were two, three important steps, uh, points in this thing. Now we have to do those carefully to get this, to get this answer right. The first one important thing is that the cutoff is never in n. It's in physical momentum. So it's in n by L. In physical distance. You know, n is a fictitious thing, but distances are not fictitious. Okay, when we did this sum, we wrote this as half of um, half. We we use the fact that this is f of zero plus half of f of zero plus f prime of zero by twelve. Right? In our case, f of zero was zero, but I'll write it anyway because it won't be zero for the other case. So it's half of f of zero plus f prime of zero by twelve. Well, sorry, where this whole thing is f, so let's call this g. Where g is equal to uh, x by l, uh, f of x by l, n, uh, x by l lambda. Right? Um, in this case, f, g of 0 is 0 because of this. f prime at 0, well, we had to differentiate um this quantity you know and then that's an integral uh, uh, yes and then that is plus uh integral from 0 to infinity g of x dx um was this sorry maybe these were with minus yeah, I think both of these came with minus. Right, it was the integral minus these, right? Does somebody remember? I mean, I'm just looking it up. If you, that would be great, actually. Uh, yeah, I think the formula was for half g of 0 plus g1 plus g2 plus g3. So it is equal to integral, and I think mm. minus 1 by 12. Um, I think minus 1 by 12. But assuming that's the case, we'll go on. In this case, this was half, and then this was zero. This was effectively just um, uh, mm, yes, one. So it's minus one by twelve, and this was integral x by l g of x by uh, l lambda dx. Now we, hmm? Yeah, I think it's uh, minus a half. Minus a 1 by 12. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, minus Of uh, L. Plus it's plus? Yeah, I mean, it's ordinary oh. number of 2k over 2k factorial. Ah. Oh, yeah. It's actually a little hard to, okay, to read off. I think that in this formula it came with a minus. Yeah. <laughs> we got a minus 1 by 12. Yeah. Ah. Okay, great. So, sorry, this was f x by L times f of uh, x by lambda. L lambda dx, and then we just change variables, right? We change variables to x by L lambda. Okay, so we get we got this was something some number, time, and this went from zero to infinity. That was important. Yes. 
Uh, so we got some number times L lambda squared. This was of the form that could be cancelled by a local counter term. This was not. Yeah. Um, this, sorry, this is 1 by 12 L because the L was still there. Right, because G of X was you differentiated here and this was 0. Okay, and so in the end we got, uh, uh, apart from this half, we got the minus 1 by 12 L. That was our, uh, our answer. Right, that is what was said. And then there was the half. That's what set the zero point energy. Okay, now uh, we're going to repeat that calculation where the sum runs not over uh, not over integers but over a half integers. Okay, and see what the differences are. Okay, so first we get half of, and now it is half by L plus 3 halves by L, basically it is N plus half by L, okay? So once again what we do is um, regulate that sum, so it's half of N plus half by L times F of, once again we regulate with the physical momentum, that's important, N plus half by L. Lambda. Ah, by L lambda. Thank you. Okay. The sum is N is equal to 0 to infinity. Okay. So now this is half of, first term is the integral. So integral 0 to infinity of X plus half by L F of x plus half by L lambda dx. Then you're supposed to subtract the function evaluated at zero. Okay, now the function evaluated at zero near zero, this is very close to one because it's f of some number of order one divided by lambda which is very large. So it's f of zero and our regulator had the property that if f of zero was, was one. Okay, so minus, this is half 1 by 2L, uh, and then you're supposed to subtract half of that, so 1 by 4L, that's the minus G of 0, minus half G of 0, okay, minus 1 by 12 times G prime, okay, now G prime, here what we could do is either differentiate this, or differentiate this. Now this won't be 0 when we set n equals 0, but when we differentiate here, we pull out an extra factor of 1 by lambda. So that's 0 for, as far as we're concerned. So we only differentiate this guy. So this character becomes minus 1 by 12, uh, the same minus, basically minus 1 by t uh, 12, uh, the same uh, minus 1 by 12 L that we had before. Because you difference it. Well, 1 by 4 also had L, yes. Okay, so this, this guy is the first difference. This is unchanged. This guy is the first difference. But now the second difference comes from here. Second difference comes from here because you see, what is important is that we switch to the variable inside this f. So let's call y is equal to x plus half by L lambda. Okay? Now what, and then we change to the integration variable y. So we will get this, we'll get half L lambda squared integral. But now y will not be integrated exactly from 0 to infinity. It will be integrated from 1 by 2 lambda. L lambda to infinity. Okay. Uh, yeah, 1 by 2 L lambda. 1 by 2 L lambda to infinity of, uh, um, and now this is the same function as before, of y by L. Um, of y, f of y. Right? 
Now, this is a pure number, except it's not quite a pure number because there's some L in lambda dependence from the lower limit. So, we break this up into an integral from 0 to infinity zero to minus this. Okay, so the part that is 0 to infinity will be cancelled by counter term. So, this is the same thing as minus half integral 0 to 1 by 2L lambda. Y f of y. And of course, there is the L lambda squared. Clear? Now, all through this integration range, f of y is very near 1. So you can forget about f of y. But y is whatever it is. So this integral becomes y squared by 2. Okay? So this integral becomes 1 by uh, 2L lambda, the whole thing squared, and an extra factor of half. And the important point is that and this with another sign. Okay, yeah, that's sign and sign. Yes, have I got it right? No, in the sense that will be zero to infinity minus, minus and that's what was my and minus. Another minus because oh no, okay. No, this is sign. This is sign. This is good, right? The important really important point here is that the lambda squares cancel. Yes. It's a finite contribution. Finite contribution also one by L. Yeah. Okay? So, and uh, let's get the coefficient carefully. So, it's 2, 16, right? So, minus 1 by 16 L. Okay? So, where previously we had mi minus 1 by 12 L, now what do we have? Okay? Now what we have is... Right, we did this right, right? So it's out that it's also minus minus. Um, but let's see. Somehow this looks suspicious to me. Just, just a minute. Uh, okay, but let's let's see what we had. Where previously we had minus 1 by 12, this goes to minus 1 by 12, minus 1 by 4, minus 1 by 16. Okay, now 48 looks like the... Ah, thank you. What? I, I, had I taken the half factor and saying minus 1 over 4? But in the 12th, so in the 12th, that was g0 by 2. Wait. Oh, that was what g0 by 2. Yeah, g0 by 2. Yeah, g0 was half and then, yeah. So I didn't take that into account to the minus 1 by 4. And here also I didn't take into account, right? This, uh, oh, did I? Here I took into account. Thank you. Uh, so let's forget the half. Um, yeah, so I got an ex extra half from here. You're right, minus 1 by 8. Okay, so um, so 24 is the LCM. So it's equal to minus 2 minus uh, 6 minus 3 by 24, which is equal to minus 11 by 20. Minus This is looking extremely suspicious. Just a minute. No, so it, it should have switched sign. Uh, what have I done wrong? Just a minute. Um, just a minute. I suspect that the minus 1 by 4 was a plus. <laughs> I've just got it wrong. Just, 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 just what have I done wrong? Just, just one minute. Um, just 
Yes, Wednesday. This looks okay. Zero to L, that looks okay. Um, I thought the Euler Maclaurin formula was half G0 plus G1 plus G2 and so on was equal to integral minus this. Is that so? Can I see your formula? So the integral is taken to the left side. Uh -huh. The first thing comes the plus, and everything is like uh, f b minus f a type of thing. B is infinity, uh, f n is infinity, m is zero. So the f prime g prime comes with the minus sign, but the f zero comes with the plus. Ah. Ah. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. The F0 comes with the plus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, first correction was that this should have been plus. G0 by 2, right? The by 2 is correct? Um, I put it at 0, I get half and by by 2. So this is okay, fine. Um, minus 1 by 12, this is not changed. Plus 1 by 24. Plus 1 by 24? Yeah, that's what it turns to. That plus 6 is, that minus 6 is turned to plus 6. Ah, uh, that's good, but uh, according to Pulchinsky, um, it should have turned, minus 1 by 24, I mean including the half, should have turned to plus 1 by 16. Uh, so we can have somewhere to go. Somewhere to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> let's see. So we've, we've done okay here. Uh, let's just, the minus 1 by 24 is not changed, right? Because we just take the prime. That clearly doesn't get contributions from there. That clearly doesn't care about, that comes all, all from here, and then we set x equals 0. That has not changed. And what about this, this um, integration? Just, just one, one minute. I messed up something stupid. Uh, One by eight minus one by eight. We've done this before, right? We did it for the fermions. When we did the fermion zero point energy in the NS sector, it was the same calculation. There we got it right. How do we get it wrong now? Just, just give him one minute. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, wait, wait, wait. Thank you. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. I just read Pulchinski wrong. Okay. He says, X, the zero point. Uh, yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Very, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. He said, X25 is shifted from minus 1 by 24 for a periodic boson to 1 by 48 for an anti periodic boson. That's, uh, and the difference between these two, he com comments, is 1 by 16. <laughs> that was, I was looking at the wrong. Okay, we're good. We're good, we're good. Okay, so, uh, uh, so we got, um, um, uh, therefore, minus 1 by 24 has gone to plus 1 by 24L has gone to plus 1 by, 1 by 12L has gone to one, uh, plus 1 by 24L. Okay, excellent. So now we can compute the, um, the spectrum. Uh, now we can compute the spectrum in the uh, um, uh, 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 the spectrum of closed string states in the twisted sector. Let us remember that we had um, that we had m squared was equal to my uh, was equal to four by alpha prime into n minus one, right? Now. This n was like the uh, um, this n was the oscillator number from left moving sector, the energy from the left left moving part of the oscillators, and this minus one came from the zero point energies of all the twenty four free bosons. Okay, this minus one was a minus one by twenty four into twenty four. Now what we get instead is minus 1 by 24 into 23 and then plus 1 by 48. Right, because one of them has been replaced, one of the minus 1 by 24 has been replaced by plus 1 by 48. Okay, so we get minus 1 plus 1 by 16 because the difference between 1 by 48 and minus 1 by 24 is 1 by 16. Oh, okay, and therefore we get minus 15 by 16. Okay, and so the formula becomes m squared is equal to 4 by alpha prime into n minus 15 by 16. Let's check this. Aha. Right. Okay, good. So, so this is the spectrum of twisted sector states in, uh, uh, for the Oberfold. Okay, now of course, um, the state with n equals zero remains tachyonic. But every higher state becomes massive. In particular, there are no massless states e in the Oberfold theory. We will soon talk about all of the, uh, we will soon talk about the supersymmetric extension um, of the orbifold, and when we do that, the tachyonic state will be projected out. What we'll be left with is massive states, no massless, you know, no massless states. So we will have these states stuck to the orbifold wall, which are all massive. <laughs> okay, excellent. So this is the spectrum of uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, fermionic states in the uh, um, uh, in the twist in the uh, in the uh, twisted sector. Now, so if we had uh, uh, the number of orifold, orifold uh, directions greater than 16, there would be no tachyon in the spectrum. That is a very good point. If the number of orifold directions was greater than... Greater than orifold 16. Yeah, precisely at 16, it, it becomes, becomes zero. But minus right. Two. But there's no tachyon in the twisted sector spectrum. But of course, the tachyon in the untwisted sector Continue. will continue to exist. So the theory will still continue to be badly behaved. Mm. Uh, but it's true that in the untwisted sector, even in the bosonic string, there would be no, uh, there would be no tachyon. It's a good point. Okay, excellent. Um, okay. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is to, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. 
The next thing that I'm going to do is to um, is to compute the partition function of this. Uh, um, the next thing I'm going to do is to compute the partition function of uh, uh, of a theory. Okay, so I'm going to compute the torus partition function. We compute the torus partition function and then right. Uh, then we, we, we'll talk about the Hilbert space interpretation a little more. Okay. So um, as usual, what we're going to do is to split this up. I mean, as we've indicated, what we're going to do is split this up into four. There's this one one plus t one plus t. 1 plus tt. Okay, this is the uh, we want to we want to look at each of these uh, each of these guys. This guy is the usual guy. There's going to be half of all of this. That's going to be a partition function. This guy is the usual guy. Okay. The question is, what about this? Okay. Now, let's see. Um, what does the this operator takes x to minus x? This operator t is an operator that flips that takes x to minus x. That's what it that, that's what it's supposed to do. Okay, but you know what we had in the untwisted sector was x was equal to um, x was equal to uh, focusing on the oscillators. Uh, Alpha, uh, alpha n e to the pi n sigma, blah, blah blah blah. So clearly, x goes to minus x is alpha goes to minus alpha. Obviously, the whole field goes to minus itself, so every oscillator term goes to minus itself. Okay, so this, how does this p operation act on oscillators? It's just flipping. It's just minus one to the power number of oscillators okay the t operator on a state with n oscillator excitations gets the sum minus 1 to the power n is this clear because t on vacuum is is vacuum t on let's say alpha minus m on vacuum is equal to minus of alpha minus m on vacuum so it just takes that sign and gives it a state and gives it a sign. That sign is just the total number of oscillators. Okay. Um, so for let's look at this guy. This guy is doing the partition function in the untwisted sector. So for the oscillator part of it, how has the partition function changed? Well, the old partition function was one over one minus q, you know, one over one minus q squared, one over one minus q to the power n. And then a similar thing on the anti-holomorphic side. Okay, but uh, now each of these was the number of times that particular oscillator acted. Then we were, you know, Taylor expanding this guy gives you the k, the the n equals one oscillator acting once or twice or thrice. Exactly. All we have to do is make it one plus. Okay, so the oscillator part of the partition function is simply 1 over 1 plus q to the power n, 1 over 1 plus q bar, uh, q bar I suppose, to the power n, uh, product n is equal to 1 to infinity. Okay. Mm. 
next question is what about the zero mode? So, so far we dealt, uh, dealt with the oscillators, okay? Uh, then we have the zero mode, okay? But now what, what we want, you see, wh what was the, what I want to claim is that the zero mode sum is just completely projected out, okay? Uh, how do we see this? Well, um, uh, once again what we want to do is to take every state, okay, we want to take every state, see, suppose we were in momentum basis, yeah, in fact this is how we compute, right, what, uh, in, the, in the zero mode sector, what we do is we've got e to the power minus k squared by whatever, and we have d3k or d, in this case, for over just this one direction, so dk by 2 pi. Okay, uh, this k squared by whatever is, you know, the alpha prime by two, all that. Non-relativistic particle of mass one by one by alpha prime. I'm not writing all that, you, you understand that. Now, where did this come from? Where did this formula come from? What it, ca what it came from was tracing over the zero mode states, so tracing over the states of quantum mechanics. So it was, it was k e to the power minus k squared by number times k and then this trace had this integral dk by 2 pi. This is where it came from. Okay? Uh, or maybe, you know, this was k, k prime, and then uh, dk, dk prime. Okay, right. But the important point is that now we put, we're going to put a t. What does t do to k? It makes it minus k. And wh uh, what do you know about the uh, inner product between k and minus k? Delta k plus t. Uh, yeah, it, it, but uh, since they're equal, since yeah. the trace forces them to be equal, yeah. the inner product is just zero. So except k, and except the one case, k is equal to zero. K itself is zero. Zero. So this, this whole integral is projected onto one state. In which is zero. The zero mode. So that integral is not there, it's just replaced by one. So basically in the, um, this thing has no contribution from the zero mode, okay? So, so this guy was half of the usual story and that half of the usual story comes with its im tau, one over im tau, one over square root im tau which came from the zero mode. Half of usual. Uh, which is q q bar to the power minus 1 by 24 uh, uh, times by square root tau 2 times 1 by 1 minus q to the power n 1 by 1 minus q bar to the power n product n is equal to 1 to infinity. That was this guy, just the usual thing. This guy here is is has two differences. First, it's this half, there's a zero point energy that remains, minus one by 24. It's the same zero point energy because we're in the untwisted set, okay? Uh, and then there is this one plus q to the power n, one plus q bar to the power n, but there's no in tau business because there was no contribution from the zero mode. Okay, there may have been some number here which I'm not getting straight because, because of the, uh, we, we, we come back to that. Okay, excellent. Now, what about these guys? This and this. Okay, um, well, let's look at this first. This guy is, oh, sorry, this first. This guy is T here and one here. Now, there are no zero modes. It's just that the uh, oscillators have become half integrally moded. Okay, so this part is very simple. This part is half. Now this is q, q bar, not to the power min minus one by 24, but to the power plus one by 48, because the zero point energy has changed. Okay, 
Um, and this guy is 1 over 1 plus q, sorry, 1 minus q to the n, 1 over 1, 1, 1 minus q bar to the power n, product over n. Okay, and then finally this character is half, same 0 point ng, q q bar to the power 1 by 48, and the only difference is that these guys get flipped. 1 to infinity, 1 over 1 plus q to the power n, 1 over 1 plus q bar to the power n. Okay, so uh, the sum of these these four terms gives us the uh, the full partition function of this this orbifold gang. Okay, now uh, um, now uh, uh, now Pulchinsky writes this in terms of uh, um, Pulchinsky writes this in terms of. Uh, uh, theta functions and so on and shows that it's modular invariant explicitly by theta function manipulations. This will take on faith. Okay, it just turns out to be modular invariant. I had to be if we done it right, right. Okay, we've got an explicit formula. Then you can write in terms of functions that mathematicians like. Um, and, uh, 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 and okay, we just, we just go with this. Okay. Now there is one last thing that I want to uh, that I want to tell you about here that is sort of important, uh, and then we'll then we'll move on. And this one last thing goes as follows. Um, so far, what we've been doing was orbifolding on the real line. Now let us look at orbifolding on the circle. Suppose we've got a circle, circle, a circle compactification and we make an orbifold. We want to understand geometrically what we are doing. Okay. So suppose we have x, which is the same as x plus 2 pi r, and also x is identified with, with minus x. Okay, so uh, here, wh uh, what is going on here? That's the that's the next question. Is this clear? Is the question clear? Okay. So um, Okay, so now let's see. Suppose we draw this real line here, and we have zero uh, minus two pi r, uh, two pi r, and so on. Points are identified by these shifts. That's the circle identification. But they are also identified by reflections. Okay, so let's look at this point. This point here is identified with this guy. This guy halfway across is identified with this point. Okay? But this guy here is identified with this point but was also identified with that point. So do you see that putting the theory on a circle gives two fixed points to the identification? Exactly. Okay? So, uh, this identification, zero, this point and this point are identified. But also this point and this point are identified. Right? Because this point is identified with uh, this and therefore with that. Did I say that right? Sorry, I'll just, yeah. This, suppose we had pi r, we could do it here. It's identified with just a little bit before this, and therefore with this guy. Okay? 
So when we've got when we've got x goes to minus x on a circular identification, we've got the first thing to remember is that we've got two fixed points. The total number of fixed points in general, if you have a, a toroidal identification and you have uh, x goes to minus x in all the toroidal directions, then the, and the torus is a p torus, then the number of fixed points is 2 to the power p. Because 0 and pi on one, 0 and pi on the other, and so on. OK? Uh, now, the next thing to ask is what are the set of possible twisted sectors in this? Um, uh, in this theory. So now, you know, in some sense, what we've done is halve the length of the circle. So we already knew that this point was not different from this point. So it was 2 pi r identified. But now this point is being identified with this guy. OK? So really, everything is happening on a, on a, on a distance of length pi r. Okay, so now now the question now the question that we could ask here is what are the sets of twisted sectors in this theory? Okay, um, so let's see. Mm. Yeah, but we have to, the, and how much of it can be unwound yeah. because of the, the identification? Let's see, does he talk about this? Mm. Sorry, give me one second. Give, give me one second. Polchinski doesn't talk about this at all. Let me come back to it next class because I fear I'll say something wrong here. There's this issue about how many of these winding strings can be unwound. And I know I've got it wrong previously when I've thought about it. Um, 
It's the, uh, the question is, in this situation, um, Doesn't look like there should be a real winding, right? Because it's an integral. Uh, right. You see, yeah, that's the point. The point is this. See, suppose I've got my my integral. This is zero pi, and this is uh, two pi. R. Be before this identification, the important thing is that the orbifolding here also means effectively orbifolding by reflections around here, as we've seen. Now, suppose I take a string like this, which previously was winding around the circle. What is this doing? On this interval, it is doing this and then coming back. Because this point is the same as this point. All we're doing is taking the string there and coming back. And so that's just a closed string, which is shrink can shrink to 0. See, th this winding here, this winding motion around the whole circle, yeah. which was genuinely topologically disconnected from an unbound sector before the identification, now no longer is. It's just a string going and coming back. There's nothing to prevent us from now continuously changing it to this which can then shrink to 0. Right? The point is that here. Wait, what the pin point? I mean, yeah. I, 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 but you know, all we're doing is having it end here. So good. So the only special thing is it was just going through here. Yeah. So it was, let's say that you demanded that it begin and end here. That's fine. So it loops up to this point and comes back. Yes. Now this point can come. It can just be dragged here. There's nothing special about this. In the sense that this goes and comes back. Unless it's forced to end here. That is special. Yeah. That is genuinely special. Yeah, that's what I'm talking Exactly. About. So yeah. in this situation, what we will have is effectively three kinds of twisted sectors. We will have states that go that are forced to go here, that, that end around zero. The, we will have states that that are localized around pi. And we will have states that stretch from 0 yeah. to pi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, but, but pi 0, no, 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 0 and pi are not identified. So that's yeah. not allowed. So it's just states that stretch around 0 and states that st stretch around pi. You know, pi is, we've got identification of around reflections around 0. Yeah. We've got identification of reflections around pi. Yeah. But it's not like 0 and pi are identified. Right. So this is not, a, this is not an allowed this is not an allowed thing. Because when you go around 2 pi in yeah. sigma, you have to come back to yourself. And this is not coming back to yourself. Yeah. Right. So in fact, there is nothing. It's just the twisted sector states around the two, around the two fixed points. The winding states just do not exist in this theory. The winding? I think every winding does not exist. Because you see, suppose you have uh, a higher winding. It's like going there and coming back, going there and coming back. Yeah. All can just be shrunk down to zero. Right? Because this reflection just removed that winding thing. OK? And uh, this would now be nice to see in an explicit calculation of the partition function on S1 times mod Z. It would be nice to see that an explicit com computation of the partition function using the kind of tricks we just did. Um, on S1 mod Z2 is it consistent with this interpretation. Unfortunately, Polchinski hasn't, hasn't done it. Uh, so we'll try it next class. I won't try it on the fly. Okay. I think that the only, in, on the S1 mod Z2 uh, or before, the only twisted sectors are the twisted sectors localized around each of the two orbifolds. Nothing else. No windings. 
Okay, I hope I'm not messing this up. I know I'm. When I, I find this very confusing. Every time I think it through, I wonder if I'm getting it wrong. But I, I think this is right. I wish Pulchinsky had a statement so I could confirm, but I, I couldn't find it. But I, I'll confirm it and get back to you next time. Okay. Uh, it's irritating he doesn't talk about it because this is, of course, very important uh, conceptually. Hmm? Uh, we'll, we'll get it straight and I'll, I, I'll tell you next class. Okay. Now, there is one last thing I wanted to say about orbifolds, uh, these S1 mod Z2 orbifolds, and that's this. Um, let us remember that when we studied uh, circle compactifications, you know, just pure S1 circle compactifications, um, let us remember that we had this nice self-dual radius around which there was um, this enhanced SU2 gauge invariance. Okay? So we had R is equal to square root alpha prime around which we had SU2, um, SU2 times SU2 uh, gauge invariance. Okay? And you remember that, uh, um, and you remember that uh, 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 that that the SU two times SU two gauge invariance was basically generated by uh, um, J Z was del X and then uh, uh, the other two were e to the power i somethings that we wrote very carefully last time and similarly with J Z bar which was del X bar and the other two were e to the power i something that. I'll get it wrong if I try to write down the coefficients now, but but you have it in your notes. Okay? And now what we're going to do is to take just this simple idea and relate a particular orbifold of a circle to a particular circle compactification without an orbifold. Okay? And this is how we're going to proceed. Um, So far, what, what, what have we got? We've got that, you know, in the space of C equals 1 CFTs, just CFTs are made out of free bosons, we found a one line set of circle compactifications, which is labeled by the radius greater than or equal to square root alpha prime. And we found another set of conformal field theories, which is S1 mod Z2, which with once again the radius the uh, radius of the original S1 greater than or equal to alpha prime. The square root alpha prime. Because we did, uh, you know, we tried to do the uh, uh, orbifolding of a smaller circle, that same thing as orbifolding a larger circle because of T duality in the original thing. Okay? So we've got two classes so far apparently disconnected of half lines of conformal field theories with C equals 1. Both labeled by some radius, one with an orbifold, one without an orbifold. Okay? Now I'm going to try to explain to you that these two moduli spaces are actually connected moduli spaces. That they meet somewhere. Okay? And and how do we do this? Okay? So, what we're going to do is the following. First, we do the following. Suppose we start with the theory, just an ordinary S1 compactification at self dual radius, at square root alpha prime. Okay? And now, what I want to do is to take that theory and f construct a circle compactification at half this radius from this theory. So what I do is to take this theory and to twist it or to gauge it by a translation, okay, by a translation by 2 pi square root alpha prime by 2. Okay. 
So if I take a circle theory and then twist it or gauge it, you know, take half the half, a translation around half the circle and gauge that, or fold by that, I get a, a, a circle theory with clearly with half the radius. That is t dual to a circle theory with twice the radius. Okay, so this gauging procedure, taking this theory and gauging by a particular shift, x goes to x plus whatever, produce, takes me from here, so this was square root alpha prime, and then this is this put, put in new point, square root 2 alpha prime. This twisting procedure takes this nice theory and sends me here. This is clear? So what is seeking? You're just uh, identifying half the radius. Just identifying half the radius. So what, what does it mean? For instance, in the, in, if I was interested in creating the partition function of this theory, I'll take the partition function of the original theory and make the new partition function as 1, 1 plus t, 1 plus 1, t plus t, t. Just gauging the thing. To say that this configuration and the configuration identified by this half twist are the same. Okay? So you have to project all states by that. That's 1 plus t by 2. And then also allow for twisted sectors. So just like we did for the orbifold, this procedure of identifying a symmetry and gauging the theory by that symmetry is a very general one. Okay? In terms of partition functions, it's always this. Okay, this procedure is some, sometimes called twisting. It's a way of getting new conformal field theories out of old conformal field theories. You start with a new uh, a conformal field theory, and then identify some symmetry, and then gauge the theory by the, that symmetry. Th that configuration and that configuration related by that thing are related by the same thing. Level of partition functions, this is what it means. Yes, yes. Then we take the half shift on that circle so with, R. with a R. pi R. R. We identify, we, we had already, see, what we, what we want to do is this. We want to make a theory of a circle of radius pi square, uh, sorry, of radius square root alpha prime by 2. We can do it in two steps. Okay, first identify shifts by integer multiply uh, multiples of square root alpha prime and then do a z2 identification on that okay that's that's all we're doing i'm saying that we can do the identification by doing one and then the other okay in so what i'm saying is that there is a simple way of regarding the uh, theory with half the radius as a z2 orbifold of the theory with the original radius this is just uh, an obvious and generally true statement it's not usually a useful statement, but here it's going to be useful. It's going to be useful because we have this SU2 times SU2 symmetry. Is this clear, Schumann? You're looking confused? Okay, great. Now, the next thing we're going to do is to, is to say, well, since our theory had this SU2 times SU2 symmetry, okay, this identification that we've done if we take that identification and act on it with an SU2 times SU2 symmetry and manage to get some other, other apparently different looking identification, it will also be the same theory. Okay? Now, let's, in order to understand how to do that, let's look at it this way. Translations was motion in X. And so it's generated by JZ, which are just translations in X. In fact, by, the, by a linear diagonal combination of, uh, of, uh, uh, of JZ and JZ bar. Okay? So wh what we do is to take this, 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 this JZ, JZ bar, JZ plus JZ bar, which is, which is translating. Okay, and uh, the, uh, we make a charge out of that, weighted by the amount we translate, and that is the twisting operation. 
The important point is that we have identified it now within the symmetry algebra. Okay. So, now what we want to do is to take that guy and rotate it. Since we know how symmetry generators rotate, uh, since we know how symmetry generators rotate, uh, we can do this easily. So let's look at the exact thing, the, 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 the thing that we're going to do. Uh, okay, so give me one, I'll say this correctly. Okay, let me let me let me let me say it the way Pulchinski likes to say. See, um, we are going to need we are going to need the actual expressions for these these objects here, uh, which I'm going to write down what I remember, and you guys will correct me if you can. Uh, e to the power i. Um, uh, Square root alpha prime. Oh, please, please help me if you can. Yeah. Just anyone have notes? <laughs> where, where, where uh, I? I think this one. Maybe. E to the power, very good. 2 by alpha prime XL, e to the power 2 by alpha prime XR. Excellent. And with, a, with an I. Square root alpha prime? Uh, yeah, square root. Numerator, denominator? Uh, no, it's uh, denominator. denominator. Yes. Okay. Now, the way Polchinski argues is as follows. It says, look, what we are doing when we shift x is we are shifting both xl and xr. Okay. So, let's see what this does what this operation does to these three symmetry generators. Okay, Let, what it does to Jz is leave it invariant because it's a motion in the translation, there's a commuting operation. Okay, but what, it is, what does it do to Xl and Xr? This Jx and Jy, to these, these other guys. Well, what this does is to shift this by Xl goes to Xl plus square root alpha prime pi by uh, by 2 because x was xl plus xr. So you're shifting xl and xr equally. Okay, each of them is being shifted by by half of this, so that x gets shifted by square root alpha prime pi. Okay, so now what does that do? This shifts this exponent, the square root alpha prime cancels, the 2's cancel and we get e to the pi pi. So under the shift jx goes to minus jx and jy goes to minus jy. Okay, but jz goes to jz. So exactly the same on the uh, on the uh, anti-holomorphic side. Jx goes to minus j, jx bar goes to minus jx bar, jy bar goes to minus jy bar, and jz bar goes to jz. Now, um, now. Can you think of a geometrical SU2 times SU2 action that would implement this, that would implement this transformation of currents? Good. So, uh, no, 
or yeah, ICU two is important because in it was free. No, uh, it's. I think uh, it is it to the I five sigma three. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. But just physically. Yeah, I mean, uh, rotate about rotate once about the z direction. By rotate pi. by by pi around okay. the z. <laughs> See, because what you want to do is to take x and flip it to minus x. Yeah, yeah, and flip yeah, y to pi. minus y. Yeah. So pi rotation around the z axis will do this job. Yeah. You have to do it from both. So you have to simultaneously rotate by pi around the z axis on the left yes. and z axis on the right. In fact, if you actually built the current, the operator that we were working with, you will see this. Because it is, it, you know, it's the exponentiating del x by a certain amount. Yeah. It is e to the power i times square root alpha prime by 2 times del x. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to put the charge. OK? And then getting the, then jz was related to del x by some alpha prime and so on. It will be basically rotating around the jx axis by some amount. And you get the numbers carefully, it will be pi. That's what manu the maneuver to go to jx and jy has saved us, keeping track of those normalizations. So it's just a pi rotation around the jz axis and the pi rotation around the jz by x. OK? That's great. So now, but since we have this pi rotation around the j, uh, jz axis uh, and the jz by axis, but nothing was special around j, uh, about jz. SU2 times SU2 allows you to change this into a pi rotation around the one axis and simultaneously a pi rotation around the one bar axis. Okay, now what will that do? If you do a pi rotation around the one axis and the one bar axis, um, What it will do is to take j2 and j3 to minus j2 and minus j3, leaving j1, j1 fixed. But what was j1? j1 was e to the power i, whatever, 2i by uh, 2 by square root alpha prime x plus e to the power minus 2x by square root alpha prime. It was the cosine j plus plus j means that was j1 j2 was the same thing but with the minus sign and j3 was equal to del x with some coefficient now look at what operation achieves taking these two to minus themselves leaving this guy unfixed uh, this guy change, uh, unchanged it's a boss and x goes to minus x so you see, the same maneuver of pi rotation around the z-axis that just halved the, sign of the size of the circle. If you did the same maneuver around the x-axis, it does something that looks naively completely different. It's the self-dual radius or be folded by x goes to minus x. But these two are related by symmetry transformation. So it's actually the same theory. OK? And so what we have concluded is that the space of c equals 1 CFT is, looks like this. The square root alpha prime is an ordinary circle. There's two square root alpha prime. And then there are orbifolds. Here, what we were orbifolding? was the theory at radius square root alpha prime. So the self-dual circle radius theory, or z2 overfolded, is same as the, un the twice self-dual or half self-dual circle radius circle unoverfolded. Now this looks like an extremely surprising statement. Okay, it looks like an extremely surprising statement. And of course, it's a statement that requires check. Now, 
the obvious check for the statement is to check the partition functions. Okay. And when you write down the partition functions, origin, initially they look totally different. But you reuse the right theta function identities. And they turn out to be the same. They don't work at any other radius. But precisely at these radii, the two partition functions completely agree. And by now there are very serious checks of these kind of these kind of statements. That is absolutely true. Okay? This is, by the way, is an example of a CFT duality. It's like that, like bosonization was an example of a non-trivial duality between between theories. Two theories that initially start looking completely different actually turn out to be the same thing. Okay? So what we've understood here is that if you take an a self-dual th theory, a circle at the self-dual radius, and Z2 overfold it, it looks very different. It looks very different from what you would get um, for, from an unoverfold theory. Geometrically, it looks very different. You know, there are no winding modes. However, there are new states, right? There are new twisted sexist states. The winding modes were not particularly light or heavy because or you were forced to be at self-dual radius. The twisted sector states are not particularly light or heavy. You just compare. The spectrum matches bit by bit. Okay, so uh, I'm going to leave you with the following exercise. Okay, uh, instead of this formal operation of matching the of matching the partition function. Which you know, then you use some theta function identities. You don't really learn very much. What I'd like you to do is to take the spectrum of the two theories obtained from canonical quantization in the untwisted sectors and in the twisted sectors. Okay, for the circle theory, of course, it's very easy. We've done this many times. For the orbifold theory, you know how to proceed. There are the twisted sectors around each of the two each of the two fixed points, and then there's the untwisted sector. And at least for the first few levels, at least for the you know, energies up to, I don't know, 10 or 6, I mean a anything that looks reasonable to you, check that the spectrum is actually exactly the same. And from by doing this check, tell me how winding states in one thing map to, you know, just tell me how it works. Okay, investigate this duality in a little, in a little detail. Okay, great. Uh, as far as people know, I don't think there are any proofs, but as far as people know, the full spectrum of C equals one conformal field theories, the full moduli space of all C equals one conformal field theories is drawn on this blackboard. There are two half lines that meet at a point. As far as people know, there are no other conformal field theories at C equals 1. This is the full moduli space of uh, C equals 1 conformal field theory. You know, this is a toy example of something that is a great problem in theoretical physics. That is to classify all the conformal theory, all conformal field theories, all fixed points of the renormalization group. This is a grand goal of, one of the grand goals of mathematical physics. Or one of the grand stepping stones in mathematical physics. Uh, and uh, we're far from being able to do that for any serious point. But in two dimensions, we can break this problem up into C by C. Central charge by central charge. And the problem of classifying all unitary conformal field theories for C less than equal to 1 has been accomplished. We've not talked about that kind of thing here, right? Maybe, maybe next class I can tell you about that. It's a beautiful story. I, I, are you familiar with this minimal model story? Even you're not familiar with that, I would have imagined that would have been breakfast for you. <laughs> uh, no, it's a, it's a very beautiful story. Uh, uh, you sh certainly should know it. Well, I don't know whether the next class or not. We'll, in these rambling lectures, we'll go through it at some point. Okay, um, but uh, uh, while there are few, there are no proofs as far as I'm aware for C equals one. It is widely believed that. The classification program has also been accomplished for C equals 1. C greater than 1 is terra incognita. Nobody knows anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, even in two dimensions, 
But there is so much symmetry. Classification of fixed points of the renormalization group, very poor. So this C equals 1 with 2 permeals is equivalent to this by Bosonization. Bosonization. So it is not new. Yeah. Right. Um, exactly. Now, uh, you know, I am saying even for two dimensions we do not know, but you know, maybe, maybe the, the lesson is actually with, this is the opposite. You know, conformal field theories are pretty easy to make in two dimensions. For instance, it is so easy to make fixed lines of conformal field theories. In four dimensions, it is not easy to make fixed lines. Conformal field theories usually come in fixed points, three dimensions, they usually come in fixed points. It is true that in four dimensions sometimes you have fixed lines, like n equals 4 Yang Mills is a fixed line, but that happens because of some miracle of supersymmetry. The beta function vanished, why should it have vanished? Because of supersymmetry. Very unlikely it would vanish otherwise. Here, without any supersymmetry or anything, it's just so easy to make these fixed lines. Okay, M maybe this is telling us that actually conformal field theories are sort of plentiful in two dimensions, a little less plentiful in three, less plentiful in four. It gets sparser and sparser and sparser as if you go up in dimension. Maybe they stop existing in high enough dimension. <laughs> 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 Maybe they exist only up to d equals 6. We saw this morning the superconformal field theories do not exist beyond d equals 6. So Maybe conformal field theories also do not exist beyond d equals 6. We do not know. Okay. So, uh, uh, maybe the classification program is actually it is auto, it is ulta. Maybe it is <laughs> stupid to start in two dimensions because that is where the most of them exist. Maybe <laughs> the place to start is six dimensions. This is perhaps the reason we have done so poorly in classifying even two dimensional conformal field theories with C larger than 1. But anyway, we have we have completely classified them for C less than 1 and equal to 1 hopefully. So, at least we will go through that story at some point. Hmm? Okay. okay, so let us stop here. And mm, okay, good, good, good. No, so let us say a theory with just free scalars or free fermions is conformal. So, I should say more clearly. The conjecture would be, you know, free theories have this additional property that they have conserved high spin currents. And at least in three dimensions, it's been proved that the only theories that have conserved high spin currents are free theories. So if you want to take the statement that a theory is free, which is, you know, a, a description dependent statement, and turn it into a statement of algebraic fact. The way to word what a free theory is, is to say that it has conserved high spin currents. So the real conjecture might be that the only theories in d greater than 6, that the only conformal theories in d greater, that there are no theories in d greater than 6 that are conformal and that do not have conserved high spin currents. That all the conformal theories have these conserved high spin currents. That would be the uh, statement of the conjecture. Yes, well, you are completely right. Free theories are, are good conformal field theories in every dimension. So, uh, with free, free, by the way, bosons and fermions. fermions. Yeah. Not free Gauge free fields, free. for instance, yeah. anyway. is not conformal even when it is free outside four dimensions. Out, yeah. What? <laughs> you see, it is a quadratic theory. Even as a quadratic theory, it is not not conformal. Um, you can of course say it develops a scale, but it is just not conformal, it is not um, that. And uh, under a while transmission reaction. Uh, right, it picks up stuff. Uh, one, one way to say it, one, one way to understand why 4 is special is the following. Um, there is a natural dimension to associate with a gauge field. Why is that? That is because a gauge field appears as d mu plus a mu. So, it is a natural thing to do to associate the dimension that the gauge field is associated with the same dimension as the derivative. This is a very natural thing. Okay. Now, the statement that you were trying to make that the Maxwell coupling has dimension uh, can be worded in the, in the following way. Of course, because the theory is quadratic, you can absorb away the, 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 the coupling constant, 
But once you do that, the, the field in which, in terms of which there are no dimensionful numbers, the, the field A in which that doesn't have dimension 1 anymore, but it has d minus 2 by 2. Right, because, because it's two derivatives, derivative times derivative times field squares dimension d. These two, this is equal to 1 when d is 4. Yeah. Now, when you try to trans, when you try to make the theory conformal, by making A a dimension 1 operator, it works. But dynamics is not consistent with that in any other dimension. This is really the clash. That it wants to be dimension 1, but it's free with another dimension in every other, in anything other than four dimensions. 